Chapter 8, 27, page 1012. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can I give a man in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some, of, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. This is the word of the Lord. John, thank you very much. Um, do please keep that passage open. And on the inside cover of the last page, I think, is a, is a sermon outline. And um, I just wanted to, uh, to see if you could help me decide what is essential when it comes to the making of a cup of tea. So I brought a few things in, uh, and you need to decide whether they are essential or not. Um, sugar. Okay, I'm putting that in the note. That was a fairly universal no. Uh, a kettle. Okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm taking first impressions. A teaspoon. I'm putting that in the middle. Samuel's just saying no very loudly, so I'm being sort of slightly swayed by that. Tea. Yes. Okay, 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 good. Um, a mug. Yes. Mm. I'm putting that in the middle. Water. Yes. Okay, okay. So I think we can probably whittle it down to the things that are essential for making a cup of tea. Well, you can manage without a kettle, to be honest. You could do it in a saucepan. Apparently, controversially, you could do it in a microwave. You could heat it up over some, uh, over some wood in the backyard if necessary. But you cannot have a cup of tea without tea and water. You can drink it from a beaker, a coconut shell, a bottle, I, I don't know, pretty much anything. But if you don't have water and you don't have tea, you can't have a cup of tea. Those two things are essential for the making of a cup of tea. This morning, Jesus wants us to be absolutely clear that without the cross, there is no Christianity. The cross is essential to Christianity. It's central to who he is. It's central to why he's come. And he's going to say, 
the cross is central to following him. We cannot, and we must not expect following Jesus to be shaped by anything other than the cross. Discipleship is death and then resurrection. Let me pray as we come to this passage. Lord Jesus, we want to say with Peter this morning, you are the Christ. You are the long-promised king of everyone. Help us, please, to see why you must die and what it will mean for us to follow you. Amen. We've just seen that... um, Peter has rather splendidly answered uh, 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 the question that Jesus put to him, who do you say I am, by saying, you are the Christ. Have a look at the end of verse 29. But what about you? Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. You are God's saving king. You're the one whom the prophets pointed to, You're the one whom we've been waiting for, Lord. You've come at last to save, to rescue, to deliver. The word Christ is is Greek. Uh, It's the same word as the word Messiah in Hebrew. And it's a word full of meaning, full of history, if you like. It, It actually means anointed, smeared one, which is what happened to Hebrew kings. But just like the, um, the fact that the, the German word Führer means leader but carries a whole, a whole plane load of baggage with it, so does the word Christ. The kind of Christ that Peter and the Jews of his day were expecting is not the kind of Christ Jesus had come to be. And so we get the rather, it feels like a slight disconnect. Peter says, you're the Christ. Verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. It seems seems sort of exactly not what you should do if God's king has come. But Jesus is wanting Peter and everyone to be clear that without the cross, there can be no Christ Jesus is not the kind of king that his people were expecting. And I I want to suggest he's not the kind of king that we are expecting either. He's not the kind of Christ that people want today. We're probably, I think, coming at it from two different angles. The the Jewish people of of Jesus' day were thinking, Hooray! Jesus is the Christ! Strap on your sword! Let's go and stab some Romans, because victory is assured. At last, the people of God will be granted the land and the future which is theirs. Arise, let's get after them. The people of today, if they, if they think at all about Jesus, probably think of Jesus as their life coach. Hurrah, Jesus is the Christ. That means he will always have time for me. That means he will be there to nurture, to reassure, to soothe me when I'm stressed out. He'll lift me up when I'm down. He will be gentle when I'm feeling a little fragile. So, people of God, deep breath in. Look forward to wholeness and wellness because Jesus is the Christ. The disciples then, and anyone who would follow Jesus now, need to hear that without the cross, there is no Christ. Have a look down, please, at verse 31. Sorry, yes, verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of God must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. 
The cross is essential to why Jesus has come. The Son of Man, Jesus' favorite way of speaking about himself, he says the Son of Man must suffer and must die. Why, why is Jesus so adamant? He could have said, couldn't he, the Son of Man is going to suffer and is going to die. The Son of Man might suffer and might die. But Jesus says he must he must suffer. He must die. Why? Well, because there is no other way for us to be saved. Because our sin is so serious, our sin is such a deep problem, that unless Jesus dies and destroys the punishment our sin deserves by dying and rises again to new life, we will not be saved. We cannot be saved. It's interesting to think, isn't it, what we've seen of Jesus as we've done this little uh, trundle through Mark's gospel. We've seen him do some extraordinary things. We've sung about some of them. Some of you joined in with the actions. Malevolent evil dealt with like that. He speaks and, and towering waves and howling winds just stop. Dead people are brought back to life by the power of his word. Sick people are healed. He is astonishing. He does what only God could do. So let me ask you this question. Don't you think if there was another way the sin to be dealt with, Jesus would have found it? If there was another way to rescue us, that he would know about it? Do you think that if he could have, he would have avoided the cross? Yes, surely. Surely he would have done. Surely he could have done. But he says he must suffer and he must die. It is essential. He has come, he says, to be a ransom for many. Because our sin is so serious, without his sin-smashing death on the cross, we would be facing an eternity of punishment for our sin in hell. But because he loves his people so much, he's prepared to die for them. My sin is so horrendously offensive to God that Jesus, the perfect Son of God, had to die for me to be saved. Do you think like that? If I'm honest, I, I don't. I tend to be much more comfortable with thinking, well, I'm not as bad as them. When I slip up, I don't like to think of it as sin personally, when I slip up, it's only a little thing and it's not nearly as bad as some of the things that I hear other people do. That's how I tend to think about my sin. There is always joy and pride to be had from comparison with other people's sins. I gather it's true even in our prison system. You know who's, who's the worst of the worst in our prison system? It's the child sex offenders. So I can have mugged someone, bashed them up, and I can sit in my cell, not thinking I've done the wrong thing, but content that I'm not as bad as the people on G-Wing. I can have robbed a bank terrorize someone with a sawn-off shotgun. And far from feeling remorse, I can think, well, at least I'm not a child sex offender. They are the scum. The fact that Jesus said he must suffer and he must die 
for my sins, not for, not for just sin in general, but for my sins, for the sins of Rory Malley's Graham, should give me a deep and lasting sense of humility. I'm not a good man. I am not a good man. The perfect Son of God had to die for my sin. I've been told that if you're nervous about public speaking, one of the things you're supposed to do is um, imagine that everyone in the room hasn't got any clothes on. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? I can't honestly see how it would help. <laughs> but I think what it's trying to do, I think what it's trying to do is say that underneath, you know, everyone's the same. <clears throat> and so you don't need to be frightened because, you know, everyone's absolutely the same. And that technique apparently is supposed to help. I, I can't see it myself. When we walk into church, it is the cross that does that for us, all around the building. The cross that I see as I walk into this building says, Rory, you are a sinful man, and so is everyone else here. Because of your sin, the Son of God had to die. And that's true for everyone else here. So my friends, we are all sitting in the same place. It tells me that I'm a sinful person. It tells me that you are sinful people. And no one is better than anyone else here when it comes to that. We all require the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's another staggering truth that flows from this, that flows from the fact that the cross is essential to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is that Jesus loved me enough, and he loved you if you're a Christian enough, to say, I must suffer, and I must die. Have you thought about it like that? I must be killed for Rory because of his sin. Because I love him, that is what I must do. I mean, he could have said, listen, I've seen what Rory's like, and I've seen what the cross is like, and I've decided it's just not worth it. Rory is a decidedly, averagely sinful man who, who takes mediocrities to new levels of mediocrity, and he's just not worth it. He's not going to invent anything stunning. He's not going to make any massive strides forward in, in medical greatness. And therefore, I'll pass. Like Dragon's Den, he could say, it's a lovely idea, but on this one, I'm out. But he doesn't. Because he loves the Father, and because that is what they have planned together before the beginning of time, and because he loves me, and because he loves you, he says, I must suffer and I must die. Do you know this love? Do you know this love of Jesus Christ? Because it changes everything. Without the cross, there is no Christ. You've got to admire Peter, though, haven't you? <laughs> Good old Peter. Have a look at verse 32. He, that's Jesus, spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Peter's just said, um, Jesus, you're the Christ. You are God's long-promised king. Um, but I need to just, just put you straight on a couple of points, okay? Just come over here, Jesus, because there's one or two things we need to iron out about this. You've, you're a bit off beam, all right? Jesus says, this business about dying and suffering, it's, that's not the plan. 
You're not the going to the cross kind of Christ. You're the ruling in triumph kind of Christ. And by the way, we'd also like to just, you know, come along with you in that particular department, if that was all right. So let's have less of this doom and gloom about dying and suffering. And can we have a bit more of winning, please? Let's have some positive self-talk rather than all this suffering and death. And listen to how Jesus responds. You can see it there in verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. To emphasize Christ without the cross is satanic. Jesus says, I must die. And Peter says, no, no, you don't. Jesus says that is not just wrong, it is of Satan. Please listen. Please listen carefully when you hear people speak about Jesus, about Jesus the Christ, whether it's on the radio or on the telly or perhaps particularly on the internet. Do they speak about the need for him to die? Do they stress that he must die? And if they do, do they speak about his death for our sins? Because if they don't, Jesus doesn't just say they're, they're wrong. He says they're evil. The cross is essential. Listen, there are lots of other things to say about Jesus. And I hope we do say them and we must say them about him. But if we don't say that he must die for sins then we are completely wrong. Be discerning about what you read and what you listen to. If the, the, the emphasis that the, the people you're reading and listening to have isn't the emphasis that Jesus has, then listen, give them a miss. Just skip it. Have nothing to do with it. Because without the cross, there is no Christ. Well, if Jesus is a leader who comes to die for his people, uh, who, who, who does what no other leader would do, then following him is like following no one else. Because without the cross, there's no Christian either. Have a look down, please, at verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's no wriggle room here, is there? Mark makes a point of saying uh, he calls the crowd to him. We can't just go, thank goodness, uh, Jesus was just speaking to the disciples. I'm not one of the disciples. It's got nothing to do with me. Thank you very much. No, Mark wants us to see it, Jesus is addressing everyone and saying, if you would come after me, come and die. Come and take your cross. Did you spot also uh, that horrible word that Jesus used about himself in verse 34, in verse 31? It's also there in verse 34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. There it is again. There is no wriggle room. Not he might have to, in certain circumstances, deny himself. Not it would be good for those who are really keen, but it's not absolutely vital, deny himself. He must, he must deny himself and take up his cross. Without the cross, there's no Christian. There's no other way to be a Christian than to die to yourself. But before we get into that, we need to do a little bit of ground clearing, I think. You see, in, in recent times, the idea of denial has usually involved giving up booze or chocolate for Lent. Jesus isn't talking about that. And the notion that we all have a cross to bear is an expression normally meaning that I've got a problem with my back. Or that my mother-in-law is coming to stay over Christmas, and I'd really rather she didn't, but hey, we've all got a cross to bear, haven't we? Jesus is not talking about that.
the phrase was very, very clear to the people who heard Jesus speak. You see, as part of the humiliation before the awful execution that was crucifixion, the condemned would be flogged and then made to carry the cross beam of their cross to the place where they were going to be killed. If you saw someone carrying that part of their cross, you knew they're going to die. That's what they're going to do. And so when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he's saying, come and die. Die to self. Deny yourself. Say no to your self-interest, your selfishness, your self-absorption. No to self-realization. No to self-promotion. No to self. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who opposed Hitler and was uh, martyred in Nazi Germany. He wrote this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Do you believe that? If you're a Christian, do you believe that Jesus Christ has called you to come and die with him? That when you come to Jesus, you died to your ambitions and your desires and your plans. And when you were raised with him to new life, you were raised to new ambitions, new desires, new plans. It's, um, it's generally been far too comfortable in this country to be a Christian. We're moving out of an era, I think, where, um, where Christianity has been applauded. Now Christianity is sort of being tolerated, uh, and I think soon Christianity will be, if it's not already, uh, widely scorned. It used to be okay in this country to be a Christian who was known to follow Christ. Uh, it, it used to be okay to be a, a, a Christian MP who was known to follow Christ. It doesn't seem to be anymore, does it? You could ask Tim Farron, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, or Kate Forbes, who lost the candidacy for First Minister of Scotland, both because of their commitment to following Jesus. It used to be okay to be a Christian who was known for following Jesus and be a member of your WI or your local housing association or the friends of the local primary school. Not so much now. Not so much now. A friend of mine is a vicar in the, um, in the northwest of England, and he was leading a Bible study on this passage with uh, a group of believers from Iran. And it was a pretty cumbersome affair, because he speaks no Farsi, uh, and they had very little English. So um, it was taking quite a long time. They were going very, very slowly through Mark's gospel. Uh, but what was happening was uh, he would ask a question, um, the English speaker amongst them would translate it into Farsi. There'd be quite a lot of discussion. And then it would come back via the, Far the Farsi English translation to him. Uh, and then they'd have to sort of go again. So the whole thing was taking ages. And they came to this. And he said to them, what do you make of Jesus' call to come and die? And there was very, very little conversation happening. So he did what all, all Bible study leaders do, all growth group leaders do. He thought, I've got to rephrase this question. So he started, and the person who interrupted him said, um, no, you don't need to say that, we agree. And he said, what? And he said, we agree that following Jesus means death to self. And he said, I was staggered, because whenever I teach that Bible passage to members of my congregation, we spend more time going, well, it can't mean that because we've already booked the holiday and, um, and I'm sure Jesus would want us to go anyway. And I don't think it means that because, um, uh, well, we've had the extension plan for a long time and we could use it for hospitality and Jesus would like that. So, uh, and I've always thought this was the important thing. And he said, we go round and round the houses. This group of believers from Iran said, yes, we agree. Next question, please. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die, said Bonhoeffer. 
I wonder if you believe that. There's a difference, isn't there, between being a fan and being a follower? You can be a fan of Jesus, you might respect him, you might revere him, you might even admire him, you might love him. A follower comes after Jesus. A disciple, a follower knows that without the cross, there is no Christian life. A follower knows that Jesus faced shame and ridicule and rejection, and that those who come after him will face shame and ridicule and rejection. Friends, this is going to come very near to our doors if you're prepared to stand with Jesus on issues of human sexuality. You will face ridicule and you will be shamed. I'm thinking about our young people, you already know what that is like in our schools and colleges. It's coming. Are you ready for that? You will be cancelled if you abide by the teaching that Jesus gives. Is your discipleship ready for that? Well, let me encourage you. Verse 35, please look down in your Bibles. This is what Jesus says. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Just like the death of Jesus looked like defeat, but was in fact the first act in his victory. So those who take up their crosses and follow Jesus, those to whom the world thinks they've lost their life, will in fact gain everything. Jim Elliott was a missionary who died in the 1950s as part of an attempt to take the gospel to the Hurani people of Ecuador. He famously wrote in his journal, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let me pray that we would believe that too. Just a moment for you to uh, speak to the Lord in quiet as he has addressed you. Lord Jesus, we want to say you are the Christ and we're so sorry that we have imperfectly understood that. Help us please to believe and trust you. Help us please to come after you. Help us please to take up the cross and to live for you. We ask this in your mighty name and relying on the power of your spirit. Amen.